Uh, a lot of football players have committed suicide because of uh, because of CTI. Anyway, yeah. a lot of football players have committed suicide. A number of football players have committed suicide, including a uh, uh, football player from my hometown, Muncie, Indiana, uh, a guy by the name of Dave Dorson. He was a defensive back, and uh, he uh, committed suicide. At, after he retired, uh, he was in his 40s, and uh, he committed suicide. Of course, the most fam famous suicide is Junior Seau, uh, who used to play for the uh, Chargers. Uh, he was a uh, he was a Pacific Islander, uh, very relatively large man, uh, but he got on his surfboard one day and uh, paddled out uh, in, into the ocean and shot himself and killed himself. And it was a surprise to everybody. So we're talking about glial cells. The glial cells uh, are there to protect and to uh, allow the, uh, the uh, neurons to function. The first type, of course, we talked about this last time, uh, is the uh, astrocytes. And astrocytes are, are very tough. They tie themselves together. And they actually create the, uh, uh, a sheet that covers the brain called the dura mater. And... Uh, this thing is really actually quite tough. Uh, any brain surgery I've ever been uh, through, this is the, uh, the hardest part of the, of the surgery. Well, the, the in, most interesting part of the surgery is always cutting through the dura mater because this stuff is, is, is relatively flexible, but it's really, really tough. So if uh, you had a blow to the head uh, with an ax or a spear or an arrow or something, uh, one of the things that would happen if it uh, uh, it would have a difficult time getting through the dura matter. It's not as, as hard as the skull, of course, uh, but it's uh, it's very protective. And that's those are astrocytes. Uh, microglial cells are very important because they're the ones that uh, will remove the debris from the brain, the uh, the uh, uh, degenerating uh, cells. So if you and, and of course this is uh, one of the things that happens with Alzheimer's disease is the fact that you're, you're, you have all of this waste products and the waste products, suddenly the waste products are, aren't being taken out and of course that's the job of the microglial cells. They're in the case of uh, Alzheimer's disease there are so many, there are so many cells that uh, uh, it, it can't remove them all. It's not that the microglial cells break down, it's the fact that the degeneration is so, is, uh, so complete uh, that uh, the microglial cells can no longer do their job. Those are microglial cells. Oligodendrocytes uh, are, they form myelin. Uh, they, they form myelin sheaths. <laughs> uh, and the uh, oligodendrocytes are the ones that uh, form uh, uh, myelin in the uh, central nervous system. These myelin uh, sheaths do not not only protect the neuron, but accelerate the response of the neuron. Uh, and these are the ones that are in the central nervous system, so in, they're in the brain and the spinal cord. Uh, where did they get their name? Well, oligodendrocytes actually means the little tree. So that's three types that we've talked about. Astrocytes, which form a protective layer. We've talked talked about microglial cells that uh, take out the, the debris and the refuse uh, in the, uh, of, of the neurons. And then, then the oligodendrocytes form the myelin sheaths in the central nervous system. Now you would think that, uh, well, of course it accelerates the, the process. It accelerates the, the, neuron, uh, the neuron's function. So you'd want white cells uh, to be the memory cells, to, uh, uh, to be the cells that uh, uh, would, would force our brain to function. But the reality is that most of our, our mental capacity is taken up uh, through the uh, cells that are not myelinated. So they're not, there is no rapid response. It's relatively slow. So if you cut into somebody's brain, <laughs> the outer covering is actually gray. That's, those are the neurons that are not myelinated. And if you cut into the brain, then, then you run into the, uh, uh, the myelinated uh, white, uh, white portion of the brain, gray matter and white matter. So that's the part on the inside. Now the interesting thing about uh, the brain is it's gray on the outside and white on the inside. 
The interesting thing about the spinal cord is the other way around. It's white on the outside and it's gray on the inside because that has to do with reflex actions where you're trying to get away from, from somebody attacking you or something. Uh, so you need the, uh, the, the myelinated cells on the outside, the myelinated neurons on the outside. Uh, Schwann cells, and I misspelled them, uh, as you can see, they're, it's either misspelled on, in the uh, title or it's misspelled later. Actually, it's uh, supposed to have the H in there. Uh, Schwann was the guy that, uh, that uh, discovered uh, this uh, type of cell. The Schwann cells are, construct the myelin outside the brain and the spinal column. Uh, Schwann cells are small and each one will wrap itself around the axon to protect it and accelerate the response. Uh, now the interesting thing, well it's not that interesting I guess, but uh, Schwann cells are the cells that degenerate in cases of multiple sclerosis. And that's one of the reasons why uh, individuals with multiple sclerosis can no longer uh, uh, move, they can no, no longer function very well. They can't move. Eventually they get to that point, but it's a relatively slow gen degeneration because these things are, are uh, something is happening to these and we haven't really discovered exactly what's going on with, uh, with MS. If you've ever known anybody with MS, uh, it started out that, that they uh, weren't walking very well, then eventually of course they were in a wheelchair, and then eventually they couldn't move at all, and, and of course uh, at that point uh, then they died. A uh, famous actress uh, had multiple sclerosis, uh, Annette Funicello, and she died a couple years ago. But uh, she was relatively functional uh, until about the last three or four years of her life, and then she lost her mobility, and once she lost her mobility, uh, she uh, went downhill fairly quickly. When you look at, a my at the myelin formed around the axon, you will see that the Schwann cells uh, don't touch each other, but uh, they leave a gap between each cell. And this is known as the nodes of Ranvier, these gaps. And one of the things that happens, one of the reasons that the response is so rapid is because it has to jump that gap. And when it jumps that gap, it accelerates uh, the electrical charge uh, that you're dealing with. And so the electrical charge, if we're looking at, a, at just a neuron, the, uh, the, the charge is at a select speed. But with the myelin uh, wrapped around the, uh, the uh, neuron, it accelerates it as much as 112 times. So the myelin is actually very important. When an individual suffers a blow to the head, the injury tends to heal slower uh, than a blow to any other part of the body, strangely enough. Uh, of course, if we bruise our hips, if we get punched in the chest, uh, then we'll have a bruise. Uh, there will be a little bit of swelling, even, and, and it will go away relatively rapidly. But if you get a blow to the head, one of the things that happens is sometimes you'll go into a coma, and you won't come out of that coma for a number of days or a number of weeks. Some people have been in comas for years. <clears throat> one of the reasons why we have a difficult time with head injuries is because the, uh, the glial cells will, uh, will uh, accumulate moisture, and it will cause, cause pressure on the brain. Uh, one of the problems with too much uh, uh, pressure on the brain is that it will kill neurons. Uh, so you have to relieve the pressure. You can't allow uh, too much pressure in the brain. One of the things that happens with individuals that uh, have a condition known as spina bifida uh, is that uh, they have an opening. Whoops! They have an opening in their spine at the bottom of their spinal column, and because of that, uh, they. Uh, produce uh, massive, mass amounts of cerebrospinal fluid. And this causes, the, uh, this causes an accumulation of, of fluid in the brain. If we don't take that fluid off, then the individual, it will destroy neurons and the individual will have a, a severe intellectual di uh, disability. So one of the things that happens if a baby is born with spina bifida, uh, very often you will see that they have a uh, a stint in their in their brains drawing off some of this fluid so that they don't get an accumulation of fluid in their brains. Once upon a time we referred to these individuals pejoratively as waterheads because they had fluid on the brain and it causes it, it caused a uh, intellectual deficit that was uh, fairly relatively severe and that's one of the things that uh, that uh, we, we now can take care of because we have the capability of putting a stint in their, in their skull.
and drawing off some of that cerebral spinal fluid. Of course, uh, we will repair the, uh, spot, the, the spine as best we can. Uh, spina bifida is really kind of an interesting problem. Uh, some select individuals, uh, it's, uh, they have a more severe case than others. Uh, sometimes all we have to do is sew it up and everything's fine. Uh, other individuals, it, 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 it's relatively extensive and they will be uh, paralyzed from the waist down, and that's spina bifida. Uh, but of course, uh, if they accumulate uh, moisture in the, in the brain, that's uh, known as edema. And of course, uh, we see this uh, a lot. If, uh, if you get a blow to anything, if you have a problem with your ankles, your ankles will swell up, and that's what it actually is, is edema. You're accumulating fluid. Uh, an individual who, uh, whose heart is not uh, functioning properly, uh, can't take off the fluid, um, and one of the problems that they will have is they will accumulate fluid in their ankles, their legs and their ankles, so their, their ankles and, and legs will swell up. Once we, we fix the heart, if the uh, heart gets repaired, this is known as congestive heart failure. Uh, if, that, if their heart is uh, repaired, of course, uh, then they'll just draw that fluid off. However, if they're not very, if uh, they have a malfunctioning heart, one of the things we can do is we can try to draw that fluid off by giving them medication that makes them urinate a lot. And that will draw the, the, the fluid out of their body. And Lasix is one of the, the uh, uh, medications that we use for that. Anyway, edema, edema is very common all over the body, and, and actually it has a very positive function. It's trying to uh, stabilize that area. It's trying to force the body not to, not to move that area in case it's injured, and that's what edema is all about. That's, that's why it's there. So if you've ever had an injury to your knee or to your ankle, of course it's swelled up. You, and what it's trying to do is immobilize that area. That's, what the fluid, that's why the fluid is there, to protect that, that joint. Of course, if that fluid is on that joint for uh, an extended length of time, the joint will degenerate because it, uh, uh, it's being squeezed, it's being, the pressure is, is too great. If we have edema in the brain, of course, that will, the same exact same thing is happening. We have too much fluid in the area and it's, it can uh, cause the cells in the area to degenerate. And we certainly don't want that. Okay, edema. <laughs> it's good and it's bad and it's is the way the human body works. The nervous system of the human body can be subdivided into two, to two nervous systems. The central nervous system, which uh, is just the brain and the spinal column, and then everything else, all the other nerves of the body. And this is known as the peripheral nervous system. It's uh, all the other structures. And as you can see, the peripheral nervous system is everything except the spinal column and the, uh, and the uh, brain. So this, this is the peripheral nervous system over here. And that's the central nervous system there. Okay. Uh, MS does not affect your central nervous system. It will eventually, of course, but uh, but uh, it's uh, it starts out as a peripheral nervous system problem, the degeneration of the myelin, and eventually, of course, because you can't move it, it starts affecting your central nervous system. The peripheral nervous system uh, nerves are categorized by uh, what part of the central nervous system they are connected to. Cranial nerves are connected directly to the brain. Uh, spinal nerves are connected directly to the spinal column. Autonomic nerves in the autonomic uh, nervous system are connected to glands and organs and trigger automatic uh, responses from these areas. So you have cranial nerves, spinal nerves, and autonomic nerves and that is the peripheral nervous system. There are 12 cranial nerves that control sensory or muscular movements in the head or the neck region. Um, being in the military and working with the military, we saw a lot of uh, head and facial injuries. Uh, if one of these nerves is severed or damaged in any way, it will cause that part of the body not to function very well. There are four nerves that control the muscles of the eyes and the eyesight uh, sensations. Uh, these are mostly internal, so that it's, it's really difficult to, to injure that portion of your body. But of course, if you like, usually if you're shot in the, in the eye, or you get a piece of shrapnel in your eye, then uh, it takes out that whole portion. Of course, it's really hard to be shot in the eye without going into your brain and doing a lot more damage, um, especially with military rounds that are 
Yeah, anyway, military rounds are pretty, pretty good rounds. <laughs> These things are not made to injure you, they're made to kill you, to blow away portions of your body, so, to make you non-functional. Anyway, so four, there are four nerves in the, in the uh, for your eyes and your eye sensations, and usually we don't see these damaged. Uh, the four, um, there are four control muscles of the neck, face, and tongue, and sensations of the tongue, sinuses, and throat. We see damage to these a lot because it's the lower part of the face. Uh, if you get, if this poor portion is damaged, you can, this can be shot without killing you, of course. It's hard to be shot here or to damage this portion of your, of your face without killing you, but if, it's easy for the lower part of your body. Uh, so we used to see uh, these, these kinds of damages all the time. Somebody who's uh, had, the, had one of their uh, nerves damaged so that they, you know, they could only speak. It looked like they had a stroke, but they had they just been had, had damage to that side of the so, so what is the difference, or not difference, but is, when you have a stroke, is that what it really Yeah, well, yeah, it, uh, it destroys a uh, part of your brain. So if you have a stroke on the right side, it'll affect the left side of your face. It can affect the left side of your face, depending on where the stroke is in your, in your brain. Uh, so that's usually what happens. So if you have a stroke on the left side, it affects this side. If you have a stroke over here, it affects this side. And that's one of the reasons why you can function perfectly well with your right side of, you know, if it's a, if it's a, if it's a right side uh, stroke, but you, this the whole left side is paralyzed. It's something that you see. My track coach from, from high school, actually I'm going to see him next week, I hope I will anyway. Uh, he had a stroke, he had a stroke on the left side of his, of his brain and now he can't move the right, his right arm and his right leg. So he can't write because he's right handed. So when he walks, he has, to, yeah, he has to force that his right leg to move and he can't use his right arm. There's one control uh, nerve uh, sensation in the inner ear, which is good because that keeps our balance. And then there, of course, is the vagus nerve, which controls your heart, your lungs, and your digestion. It also controls uh, your sexual response. Uh, and as I think we said in this class before, if you have your, uh, you could be paralyzed from your waist down and still have sexual functioning, as confusing as that may be, but. Uh, that portion of your body is uh, controlled by your vagus nerve. So as long as you have a vagus nerve, you can have a sexual response. There are 31 pairs of spinal nerves, uh, one pair on each side of the body. There are five segments of the spinal cord and column. There are eight cervical nerves, and cervical just means color. It's a, it's a Latin word for color. Color, color, color. Okay. I'm a Hoosier, so I can't. I, I pronounce C-O-L-L-A-R the same way I pronounce C-O-L-O-R, so just because I'm from Indiana. Um, my wife was in a uh, uh, Bradley vehicle accident in Korea. <laughs> as stupid as that sounds. What the hell was she doing in the Bradley vehicle? She's a, she's a medic. They were practicing bugging out. <laughs> <laughs> and the damn thing turned over. Anyway, so she uh, damaged her neck and she damaged her shoulder. Uh, the shoulder healed, of course it was bone, but the, the neck didn't heal because it, it had to do with some of the nerves in her neck. And about five years ago, yeah, about five years ago, she had to have the uh, vertebra in her neck uh, fused. Uh, to, to isolate those nerves because those nerves weren't working properly. She had a lot of pain. Anyway, she had one of her cervical vertebra, two of her cervical vertebra fused so that that nerve didn't, uh, didn't cause her pain anymore. There are 12 thoracic nerves uh, and these are from your torso. These are in your torso and uh, thoracic just means brace. So it's this portion of your body there's five lumbar nerves, uh, and this is in your lower back, and this is usually where people damage themselves because they try to lift too much weight. Uh, they do something with that portion of their body. I've been really lucky. Um, I'm 67 years old and I don't have back pain. And I've lifted a lot of stuff. I mean, I, but I think part of it may be because I, I uh, lift weights. 
and it has, I've learned to protect myself. Anyway, I don't have any lumbar pain. I'm going to go to my 50th class reunion, high school class reunion, so we'll see how many of those guys walk around. Can't get out of the chair, uh, you know. Very am dancing around, I have no problem. Anyway, um, lumbar means belt, so it's this portion of your body. Uh, there's five sacral nerves, and, and this is the, your, your pelvis, your, your pelvic area. Those are sacral. Sacral just means girdle in Latin. And uh, then there's one coccygeal uh, nerve, and that uh, coccygeal just means tailbone. So as you can see, you've got all these nerves. And you could damage any of these suckers, and you have to be really, really careful uh, not to damage something. Uh, my first father-in-law, can I? Yeah, my first father-in-law. <laughs> Had, uh, had lumbar problems, and he had surgery. Uh, they, put a, um, and they put a wire in there, and it fixed him for a while, but then that wire, it was like they twisted it, and it had sharp ends, and eventually it came untwisted, and all of a sudden, those sharp ends started moving around in his back. He, was, he had just tons and tons of problems. Anyway, I don't know why. I don't know why, but I saw the x-rays, and I'm going, why would they do that? Who's you know, tie it off, you know, weld it or something? I don't know. You, you don't want this thing breaking open, and that's exactly what happened. It, it, it popped apart, and now he's got these sharp ends just scraping away on his and his uh, uh, and the spinal column. As horrible as that seems, and there are all the nerves that we were just talking about, as you can see. My wife's uh, problem was right at, at the base of her neck. So it was uh, C3 and C4. She had to have three, C3 and C4 fused in order to protect uh, those, uh, those nerves. Um, and that's the part that co controls your diaphragm. So she's have, having a problem breathing. Don't worry, she didn't have to pay for it. <laughs> we have all kinds. At that time, she only had Tricare, but uh, Tricare pays. Almost everybody takes Tricare because it's, it's, it's for veterans. But uh, yeah, okay. Medicaid, not so much. But uh, and actually, Tricare pays worse than Medicaid does, as it turns out. But almost everybody takes it, so she was she was fine. She had her surgery; didn't cost us anything. I had a heart attack in 2010. Uh, they had to life flight me from one place in, uh, in Montana to another, 150 miles in a helicopter, and then they did all this extensive surgery and whatnot and fixed me. It cost me nothing. It didn't cost me a penny. So that's kind of nice. Having a heart attack you not have, doesn't cost you anything. Of course, you worry about how much things cost, and then, of course, it kills you because you're worried about how much you're going to have to pay. The, auto, autom <laughs> the automatic or autonomic nervous system <laughs> uh, is divided into two nervous systems, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, the sympathetic nervous system prepares the body for action uh, by shutting down select functions and increasing your power stores and increasing your sensory activity. We're going to talk about that in just a second. The parasympathetic nervous system turns everything back on. Okay, and then, but unfortunately, these two nervous systems can cause trouble, and I'll talk about how, what kind of trouble they can cause in just a second, or maybe I won't. Oh yeah, sure I will. Uh, when the need of action is is detected, the sympathetic nervous system will dilate your pupils, improving your eyesight. So all of a sudden, you can see everything. Because remember, this is a, a, a flee or or fight situation, so you need to be aware of your enemy whoever that enemy may happen to be. If they're too strong for you, you need to run away. But you need to know who they are and where they are and, and how dangerous things are. You need to see the person over here and see the person over here. So as your eyes dilate, of course, your eyesight becomes far more acute. And now it has uh, given you the opportunity to be aware of, of who those guys are. And of course, those of us who've been in those kinds of situations, we understand it's really nice to know where everybody is. <laughs> My poor brother is uh, the one that uh, uh, has PTSD. He's, uh, he has tunnel vision. So he, he's uh, really good at seeing at nighttime and during the night. 
so good. I, when we used to, we used to play um, uh, hide and seek uh, at night, or some other game that's like hide and seek. Pee Wee stick down or kick the can or whatever. Uh, and nobody, he always won. He always won because uh, he's invisible at night. He's just the most amazing person, or he was. And we always, we thought he was a ghost or something. So in Vietnam, guess what he got to do? Be a ghost. He got to set up <laughs> ambushes. <laughs> yeah, be a ghost, exactly. Is what he was. So he got, he got to set up ambushes. And eventually, he got to the point where they'd send him out by himself. Whoops. That's not a good job. Okay. Yeah, they could never figure out if he's going to come back or not. Obviously, he came back every time. <clears throat> and it was pretty ugly because they were trying to say, well, how many, did you see anybody? And he'd say, yeah, yeah, I saw, uh, there was a squad that was out there. Did you kill anybody? Yeah, yeah, I killed a couple guys. And eventually he had to start bringing back parts to show how many people he killed. That was nasty. Yeah, this is Vietnam. They were, they were just goofy. They were just goofy. All kinds of horrible things happened. Anyway, that was one of his jobs. But during the day, it was practically functionless because, you know, he can only see. He, his peripheral vision is like this good. So he has no peripheral vision at all. So if there was anything in the dark that they had to do, like go into a tunnel, he, okay. He was a tunnel rat. Anyway, so he doesn't have very good eyesight during the day, but during the night he's got just the most amazing eyesight you ever saw. It inhibits your salivation causing dry mouth. Uh, and this, the reason your salivation goes away is because your digestion goes away. Uh, it, it'll rest your digestion. You'd be surprised how much energy it takes to, dig to digest your food. Normally if you uh, eat a meal, not your, your plum, that's a plum, right? Not your plum. I'm not talking about your plum, but if you if you eat a full meal with protein, with a lot of protein and whatnot, it takes about four hours to empty your stomach. And digestion takes a lot of energy. So the more you eat, the more energy you need. Well, that's, that doesn't make any sense, does it? Of course, the more calories you take in, the more the fatter you get. So we that's something you can talk about also. But the salivation has the, the dry mouth has to do with salivation. Salivation has to do with digestion. It relaxes your airways, uh, allowing you to, to uh, breathe deeper. It accelerates your heart rate, and that's necessary. It stimulates your sweat glands. Uh, and it stimulates your sweat glands to uh, allow you to cool off faster. Because remember, you're going to have to take off, either take off or fight that guy. Uh, it stimulates your liver to release more energy stores. So you've got, this is the, and you can feel this uh, if you've ever been in a, uh, that kind of a situation, uh, it makes you feel a little bit queasy, just a little bit queasy because you got all this sugar going, running through your body, your digestion's not working anymore, and so you get what we refer to as butterflies. Okay, your hands start to sweat. The palms of your hands start to sweat, and they itch. It's the oddest thing in the world. It slows your digestion, of course, and this is, I already talked about this, it inhibits your kidney function because Strangely, your, uh, your, your kidneys take up a lot of energy as well. And it constricts your blood vessels in, the, in your skin, making you look pale -er than you do otherwise. Okay, once upon a time, uh, I was uh, in college, and uh, I was married, and I had a child. And uh, one weekend, my wife decided she was going to leave me and go back to her mother. Uh, this is why, while I'm in college. Uh, I was uh, student teaching, uh, and I was running track, and there was a track meet on Monday, and I had to student teach on Monday. So on Friday, she decides she's going to leave, and she's giving me a, a ration of, you know what, you know, you know how wives are sometimes. Anyway, so this went on all weekend. Finally, Sunday, she just says, that's it. You know, no more. I'm not going to take any more from you. It's all over with. Um, put me in the car, and, and let's go. So uh, I packed the car, you know, I'm helping her go. There's only, we only have the one car. So I, and I needed the car on Monday to drive to my, to uh, student teaching. That's why we had the car. Uh, so we got about halfway from, uh, 
from uh, Crawfordsville, where I was going to school, to Muncie, where I lived, got about halfway, and she says, no, nah, let's go back. So we went back. By the time we got back, it was like 7 o'clock at night, unpacked the car, uh, went to bed, got up at like 4 o'clock the next morning to go student teach. Uh, so I student taught that day, and then and I had class all day after that, and then I had a track meet at, at uh, 5 o'clock. So I started running in, in the track meet, and I was slow. I couldn't figure out what was going on. I was slow. And normally, I'm not. <laughs> So what did I run? Uh, the first uh, race we ran was the 440 relay. And uh, we won the relay, but I was not fast. I don't know how the hell we run, won the relay. And then uh, then was the uh, 220. And I came in third. Came in third. I knew, I knew I was going to come in at least second because they had a really, really fast guy. But uh, I came in third behind this a person I beat every time. And then it came the 440, and normally I win the 440, but I came in third again behind two of my guys, who I always beat, they're on the mild relay team. Uh, but one of the things that happened was, after every race, even the, it's only 100 yards, you know. I, I'm a quarter miler, I can run 100 yards without even breathing hard. I started vomiting, and I threw up after the, the uh, relay, then I threw up after the 220, I threw up after the 440, and I couldn't stop vomiting. I had, I had got to the point that I was dry heaving. So for the mile relay, we needed, we needed to win the mile relay to win the meet. And I couldn't run. I, I'm, I'm laying on the ground vomiting. So they put somebody else in. They, we won anyway. Luckily, we won anyway. Uh, so then they took me in, and, and they said, oh, you must have the flu. Uh, and they took me to the hospital, and it turned out that my kidneys had shut down. And the reason my kidneys had shut down was because of my sympathetic nervous system. I'd been in a fight or flee situation since Friday, arguing with my wife. And then finally on Sunday, you know, uh, you know everything peaked, and uh, I was all keyed up. Uh, to either do one thing or the other. My kidneys, my, my back hurt. Anyway, my kidneys had shut down, and they'd been shut down for four days. Well, that, uh, that allows toxin to build up in your body. You need your kidneys to clean your, your blood out, and of course, toxins had been building up. I was in the hospital for a week. They were afraid I had a, a complete shutdown and, and uh, that they were never going to come back. Of course, they did come back, everything's fine. And uh, you can blame my wife for the rest of, the, of my crappy track season because my kidneys shut down. It took me a week to uh, get out of the hospital. They wouldn't let me run for another month, and by that time, it's almost the end of the season. So it's really kind of a tragedy if you think about it. But the reason was because of hyperadrenalinism. The adrenaline, uh, of course, I produced the adrenaline in order to, to fight or flee. Uh, and uh, because I had uh, been in that uh, situation for a number of days with no respite. Now normally in a combat situation, you're, it's not a constant thing for a, a number of days. Uh, there's a, there's a, a point when you can relax, when you can sleep. Uh, but I hadn't slept, uh, you know, I'd slept maybe 12 hours in, in those four or five days because she liked to argue at 2 o'clock in the morning or something. Really kind of insane. Anyway, I so I had hyperadrenalinism, uh, and the reason, and they called it athlete's kidney. And the reason they called it athlete's kidney was because that was the same around that same time was the thriller in Manila between uh, Joe Frazier and uh, Muhammad Ali. And Frazier, uh, he was doing fine. It looked like he was going to beat uh, Ali, and and then right at the end of the uh, the fight, he just kind of stopped. And uh, he, would, when he went to the hospital afterwards and they said, well, your, your kidneys are shut down. You have, your hyperadrenalinism has caused your kidneys to shut down. And then they, they named it uh, athlete's kidney after that. Anyway, okay, that's my story about my sympathetic nervous system working too much and having a fight, an argument with my wife. <laughs> okay, 
Okay, so once the danger goes away, you you're actually escape or you punch the guy's lights out, and your parasympathetic nervous system will, will kick in. Your parasympathetic nervous system just reverses the process. You, it constricts your pupils, uh, simulates your salivation, uh, and actually you, you may get a lot of uh, uh, salivation going uh, at, that, at that juncture. Uh, it constricts your airways uh, so that you're no, you are no longer in that uh, have uh, expanded airways. It slows your heartbeat, of course, because you don't need to fight or flee anymore. It stimulates your digestion. Uh, and potentially, uh, when it stimulates your digestion, if it's been too long, whatever food was in your stomach may have spoiled. Or something may have happened to that, uh, that food. So you may vomit that, uh, that food out because it's not good anymore. It's fermented to the extent that you can't really digest it very well. We are humans, we don't usually eat uh, food that is rotten or food that is is too fermented. Uh, the first time anybody drinks uh, fermented beverages, uh, a lot of times they'll vomit because their their bodies aren't used to that uh, that kind of uh, toxic uh, substance in their in their system. So a lot of times you'll af afterwards you'll vomit, and it doesn't have anything to do with fear. It doesn't have anything to do with with uh, anger, it has to do with the fact that this stuff's been sitting in your stomach for an extended length of time. And now you can finally digest it. And when you try to digest it, digest it, it is something that you can't, you can't actually stomach. Uh, dilates your, it dilates your blood vessels in the intestines, it dilates your blood vessels in the skin. And then, uh, so you look pale before the contest or before the uh, encounter and you look uh, flushed afterwards. Your face turns all red. And uh, your skin, if you look at your hands, you know, you can see the blood vessels in your hands. It's really kind of interesting. Anyway. Uh, okay. And that, that lady eventually divorced me, of course. Uh, we, and we continued to argue at like 2 and 3 in the morning, which is something, I don't know. But she always picked a fight before it's time to go to bed. And I don't know. Talk about sex, but we don't want to even talk about that. <laughs> Maybe she was just trying to keep me from wanting to have sex. It certainly worked. <laughs> shrew comes to mind, the word shrew, but uh, we won't talk about that. Okay, the average brain weight uh, is about 1,400 grams, uh, as Homo sapiens sapiens, uh, our brains weigh about three pounds. We are not the humans with the largest brains. There have been humans in our past, in our ancestral past, who had actually larger brains than we do. If we look at, if you believe in evolution and you, you look at all the uh, different human, uh, hum hominid uh, structures that we have had in the past, we don't have the biggest brains. Neanderthal man had the biggest brain. It was about, um, ours is 1,400 grams, uh, theirs it was about 1,500 grams. Theirs weighed about three and a half pounds. The major part of the brain is the cerebrum, uh, which is divided into two hemispheres. Cerebrum is the, uh, your cerebrum, uh, especially your cerebral cortex, is the reasoning portion of your brain. It's not the cerebral cortex in the Neanderthal that was larger. It was actually the cerebellum that was larger than ours. But his brain was larger than, than our brains are. Uh, intellectual capacity seems to be contained in the surface area of the brain. Uh, about one quarter inch of, your, of the surface of your brain is where all of your, your thinking takes place. As we said last time, the uh, more stimulation you get, uh, the larger your brain is going to be. Surface area of the brain is increased through ridges and folding uh, that triples the surface area of your brain. Uh, if you look at, in, at an individual, and when we first started doing this, when we first started taking brains out uh, and looking at them, of course, we, we, we didn't know exactly what we were looking at. Um, for the, this didn't uh, really take place uh, in a, at a scientific level until about the 19th, sometime in the 19th century. In the 19th century, they started uh, uh, having people donate their brains to science. Uh, and what, one of the things we noticed was that uh, if uh, somebody was a common laborer, uh, where they did the same thing over and over and over and over again, if you looked at their brain, they had far fewer uh, furrows and uh, convolutions 
uh, Jairi and Sulsi than an individual who had been using his brain um, in, an, in, in an intellectual capacity. Uh, looking at a mathematician, his brain is very, uh, very involved. Uh, looking at an individual that uh, does the same thing over and over again, it's not. They don't have nearly the uh, uh, convolutions and furrows that an individual that is a mathematician. And that has to do with, with uh, your, your intellectual capacity, the number of furrows and convolutions that you have. The brain has four fairly distinct lobes that have four fairly distinct functions. They're not actually painted in different colors so that you can tell where they, what, what they are <laughs> inside the brain. If, if you've ever seen one, uh, hopefully you never have. Uh, anyway, um, it's, it's all the same color. They're all gray. Most brains are gray. <clears throat> but uh, there are four very distinct lobes. Uh, the uh, most prominent lobe is the uh, frontal cortex, uh, the frontal lobe. The cortex is the front part of the frontal lobe. It's the very part that's in the front. This is one of the reasons why uh, people, they get hit in the forehead a lot. Uh, that they will damage their frontal cortex, change their personalities, and potentially it will uh, cause a, a lot of uh, interesting problems. It can potentially make them more violent the more that they're hit, hit in, the, in the forehead. But that's the court, the uh, frontal lobe is the uh, front part. That's where your reasoning, your higher, higher order thinking takes place. The parietal lobe is right behind it. Uh, it's this yellow portion here, which isn't really yellow, of course. And this is where movement takes place. This is where uh, the, uh, the brain controls uh, fine body movements. Uh, so if you're a painter or uh, if you're an artist of any, to any degree at all, then potentially that's where your artistic uh, capability comes from. Uh, from your parietal lobe. Uh, the back part is the is, is your eyesight. This is uh, where your eyesight comes from. Uh, it's known as the occipital lobe. And then the part that controls your hearing is the part that's on the side. And this is known as your temporal lobe, the blue part right there. Anyway. <laughs> so if you're an artist, which I'm not, I can barely draw a stick figure. Here you go. Is, that, is, is that a human? <laughs> A circle with lines. Okay, that must be a human. That's about the extent of my artistic capabilities. Uh, there are two hemispheres of the brain, uh, left side and right side. They're connected through the <coughs> corpus callosum. Uh, the corpus callosum is relatively extensive. It's far more extensive. It's, it is the communication between the two hemispheres and it's far more extensive in females than it is in males. About 11% larger in females than males. So they have that much more communication between their left hemisphere and their right hemisphere. And this changes some things. If uh, an individual has a stroke, if a male in individual has a stroke and it damages a select amount of their brain and a female has um, the same amount of damage to their brain in exactly the same area, a uh, female will recover faster than the male will. And she will recover more extensively than he will. His damage will, is relatively permanent and hers is not. I had uh, friends up in, uh, up in Montana that they both had a stroke at the same time. They were twins, one female, one male. They both had a stroke at the same time. Uh, hers was actually more extensive than his was. Uh, and uh, she recovered almost 100% functioning, and he recovered about 75% functioning, so, which made him angry. He was a Marine, Vietnam vet. <laughs> oh, man. He used to inject drugs underneath his skin. It's called skin popping. I don't know if you've ever seen anybody with skin pop that are skin poppers. He had, he had stopped. I mean, this is something he did after Vietnam. Uh, so he was injecting, uh, I don't know, heroin or something under his skin. And uh, it left little pock marks all over his arms, all over both sides of his arms. Dumb shit. Oh, is that on? Is that on? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, 
pretty silly. Anyway, he eventually had his, his stroke and, and uh, did a lot more damage. Um, he couldn't move his left foot. So, uh, of course, this guy had, had a standard transmission vehicle, and of course you can't, your left foot doesn't work, you can't, can't work the, the clutch. So he had to buy an automatic and made fun of himself because he couldn't, he, it wasn't a standard transmission anymore. Anyway, okay, so, uh, interestingly, if you can lose half of your brain and not lose any intellectual capability. It's kind of confusing. But if you lose half of your brain, you need to lose that half before you turn 12, before you go through puberty. If you lo lose that portion of your brain before you, you go through puberty, you'll be just as intelligent as you would be otherwise, despite the fact you're, you're half-brained. And we've seen this over and over again. Sometimes individuals will have such severe damage from epilepsy, that the epilepsy is so extensive uh, that they can't function. So we'll go in and we will take out the portion of the brain that is uh, short-circuiting. That's what epilepsy is. It's a short circuit, too much electrical stimulation. And sometimes these people will go in and will have seizures, you know, one or two a minute. Uh, and if that is the case, we'll just go in and cut out half the brain. It's called a hemispherectomy. And these individuals do not suffer uh, they're actually much better off uh, with uh, only half a brain than they are uh, with uh, part, a portion of the brain that is uh, malfunctioning. Is it is epilepsy and see are they? I got a question. Is it is it painful for them or is that is it just it's painful? For them. Yeah. Um, no. While they're having their seizures, normally what will happen is they're um, unconscious. Okay. To some extent. They can hear, but they can't feel. That's usually the way it works. Uh, they lose control of their bodily functions. So if they've been waiting to have a bowel movement, you know, they will they yeah. have defecate themselves. They'll urinate themselves. Um, yeah. It's not painful for them. Uh, the embarrassment is probably more painful than anything else. Yeah. yeah. And, and it really all depends on, on what kind of a uh, seizure it is. If it's a grand ball seizure that uh, involves you know, falling to the ground and, and uh, having all kinds of uh, spasms, um, then they, they can do a lot of damage to themselves and to other people around them. I had a friend who was a Marine. <laughs> he was wounded in Vietnam. Um, he was in an explosion and it blew off half of his penis and one of his testicles and it did damage to his brain. Uh, but it, it wasn't, uh, you couldn't see the damage in his brain, but it caused seizures. Uh, and this guy was like, you know, he looked like a Navy SEAL. He was like two, 250 pounds and, and just all muscle. This guy was just solid. Um, and so he came back, of course, uh, and he was afraid he couldn't make babies because uh, he'd lost a, a, a testicle and he'd lost half of his penis. Uh, but he did, he was able to reproduce and he was so happy when that baby came. He was the happiest <laughs> guy I've ever seen. <laughs> it was just like the happiest day of my life was the day that, that his, his wife gave birth. Anyway, uh, so he was, one day he was sitting on the toilet and he had a seizure. And uh, of course, he weighs 250 pounds. He's got all the muscles in the world. He destroyed the bathroom. He ripped the toilet off of its, and of course, it's just gushing water. And he punched a hole. It was a ceramic a bathtub with a steel lining in it, with a, a, a lead lining in it. And he punched a hole in that thing, in his bathtub. He destroyed the bathroom. And of course, he was embarrassed. He punched a hole in the wall, you know, that kind of thing. It was just crazy, but he he had that kind of uh, muscle mass that he could do that. Uh, that was the worst uh, seizure he had ever had at that point, and we started giving him uh, a seizure control medication, and it, 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 everything was better after that. The problem with seizure control medication sometimes it uh, truncates your ability to reproduce, and, uh, and that's what he was afraid. Of. So we were trying to balance. You know, he's trying to re he's trying to. Get his wife pregnant. He's, he, 
So we had to kind of balance whether, how much of that land we were giving him. He was just the coolest guy in the whole wide world. Really, really nice guy. But uh, yeah, it was the worst seizure we ever had. Anyway, it doesn't hurt. It hurt him. It really bothered him. And the crazy thing was he destroyed the toilet, he destroyed the bathtub, and it, he didn't have a mark on him. I mean, he just kicked the crap out of that whole bathroom. You know, so, he was pushing against him. So afterwards, through that whole thing, his hand wouldn't hurt? Oh, he it, it wasn't. It was the fact that uh, he laid down on the ground, and when he laid down on the ground and, and uh, uh, moved his legs, it, it dislodged the toilet, and he, because of his muscle mass, he was able to push against whatever it was that he was. When you're in a seizure, your 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 muscles will, will, will tense, and that's exactly what happened with him. He uh, knocked the toilet off uh, off of its foundation, and he punched a hole in that just because he was he was tensing up. It wasn't that he was using his fist or anything. No, he was he was completely unconscious. And of course, he was embarrassed. He had to rebuild his, his bathroom. His wife was so sweet. She was just the nicest lady. This was back in the 1970s, and uh, he was uh, Caucasian, and she was Hispanic. And uh, his family didn't want to have anything to do with him because he'd married somebody from him another group and his and her family didn't want to have anything to do with with them because because uh, she had married you know a gringo it's really kind of funny and he'd come in and talk to me all the time uh, it was really kind of interesting this guy's the toughest person you've ever met I mean he, he, oh, anyway, he was so strong <laughs> he was so powerful <laughs> and of course when he had his seizure that's why he destroyed the bathroom. Do some people with seizures bite off their tongue? Uh, do they bite off their tongue? Uh, you know, that's a worry, uh, but normally what will happen if they, if their tongue is out, and your tongue is normally not that close to your teeth, if you think about it. It's next to your teeth, but, you know. So that is not a normal position. And when you tighten up, your tongue goes down in your, in your mouth. So that's extremely mm -hmm. important. There's really no reason for them to have their tongue stuck out. Potentially they could because they, they're not really feeling anything. So potentially they could, but you know, you don't have to hold on to the tongue. The, the idea is all they will swallow their tongue. Um, no. <laughs> no, that doesn't usually happen. No, you don't have to put something in their mouth to hold their tongue down. The the real fear is them swallowing. Has that happened before? That somebody I mean, swallows like, their tongue? Yeah, what do they usually do? Just take them to the hospital and... Oh no, you have to get it out right away because that's blocking your airway. Airway. Yeah, you have to get it out right away. I was playing in a baseball game one time and our catcher, for some reason, oh, he got hit. He got hit in the head. And when he, uh, on his mask, and uh, his tongue went back in his throat and he was kind of unconscious for like two, two or three seconds. And in those two or three seconds, his, his tongue went down his throat. And he couldn't get it back out. So we had to go in and pull his tongue out. Out of his throat. No, he, no if you swallow your tongue, you'll die. Because you can't breathe. <laughs> Just don't swallow your tongue. I mean, it's not a natural response to swallow your tongue if you think about it. Uh, if you've ever swallowed down the wrong pipe, you know, you're not thinking, or sometimes you'll swallow fluid down the wrong pipe. That's happened to me. I, um, <laughs> and yes, I'm old. Maybe that's why I've, been, I've swallowed down the wrong pipe. But that's exactly what happens with your tongue. It just happens to be in the back of your mouth. and You're not thinking about it. You're not controlling it. It's muscles. And we, I showed you the cranial nerves where the, it actually controls the tongue. Yeah, don't swallow your tongue. It's not a lot of fun. And it normally doesn't happen with people with, because uh, everything uh, becomes rigid. And your tongue is a muscle, so it becomes rigid as well. So the probability of biting off your tongue is fairly remote. Probability of swallowing your tongue is fairly remote. Yeah. So we've changed all that. In the old days, they'd say, oh, you need to stick a, a tongue depressor down your throat. So people with epilepsy would carry tongue depressors so that you know their friends could keep them from swallowing their tongues, but it hardly ever happens. 
If we cross-sectioned an individual's brain, we would see that some of the brain is made up uh, of tightly packed, non-myelinated neurons, and they look gray. And of course, that's the uh, surface neurons uh, look gray. Other areas look white because of the myelinated neurons that make them up. Uh, researchers have found that the larger the gray areas of the brain, the more intelligent the individual is. This is where your thinking takes, takes place in the gray portion of your brain. So the, the grayer your brain is, the more intelligent you are. I have 1002, is that close? Yeah. Yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, as the baby begins to develop from uh, ever expanding numbers of cells, the brain and central nervous system begin as a structure known as, a, as the neural tube. In the, the beginning, the smaller, the uh, smaller, more primitive parts of the brain develop before the intellectual portion of the brain, uh, and that is, of course, your, your cerebral cortex. So the first thing that develops is your spinal cord, and then the medulla, then the pons, and then the cerebellum. And I have a YouTube video, and I don't, I didn't look at this last night when I was going over this. So let me see what that is. This may be the development of the, of the, of the baby's brain. How do I copy that? Copy, okay. Now I need to go to the internet. E. How do I do that? that? E at the bottom, that blue one. The blue one? Yeah. You, you told me that last time, right? <laughs> <laughs> Paste. Good, okay, there we go. All right, all right. Let's see if this works. I didn't look at it last night, as I said. No, it's gone. Okay, forget it. All right. Yeah, it's going to show you how the baby's brain develops. And it, it develops as a, a spinal cord first, and then the, the medulla develops, and then the pods, and then the cerebellum. And these are all the more primitive portions of your brain. So the more primitive portions, the, the part, part that has to do with movement, uh, that is the part that develops first. And then eventually, of course, the uh, intellectual uh, portion of your brain, the cerebral cortex, uh, will will develop last. Okay, okay. I just talked about the, the corpus callosum, and the women have a larger corpus callosum than men. Remember that they have eleven percent larger corpus callosum. Uh, when women drink uh, relatively steadily during uh, their pregnancy, uh, of course, the baby will have fetal alcohol syndrome. One of the aspects of fetal alcohol syndrome is that corpus callosum will not develop uh, properly. Uh, and it will be so much smaller than a normal corpus callosum, as horrible as that may seem. So they don't have uh, communication between their two hemispheres as readily as everybody else does. And that's one of the tragedies of alcohol. It will keep that corpus callosum from growing. Also, if you look at a baby who is, has fetal alcohol syndrome, uh, if you look at the, the involvement of a, ba of a baby's brain anyway, if you look at one with uh, fetal alcohol syndrome, they don't have the same uh, furrows and, uh, and, uh, and it's not as nearly as involved. It's really kind of a tragedy. Much smaller than a, a normal baby's brain, it's really a, a tragedy that uh, an individual can't stay away from alcohol while they're pregnant. Uh, we've looked at, uh, at women who, who drink during pregnancy one of the things we've discovered is the women that have the most damage to their baby's brains are women who um, are binge drinkers, the ones that only drink, you know, get drunk on the weekend rather than uh, an individual that drinks, has two or three drinks every day. Uh, yeah, yes, she's an alcoholic, and yes, she is affecting her baby, but the one that affects the baby the most is the binge drinker, the one that uh, uh, really drowns the baby in alcohol. Uh, at, at a select juncture during their pregnancy. So the binge drinker, uh, that, that, uh, that type of, of drinking causes a lot more damage to the baby's brain, as it turns out. As tragic as all that is. As tragic as all that is. <clears throat> and it does bother me, obviously, it bothers me, but the reality is that I'm not a, what's the word I'm looking for? Oh, I don't drink at all. So, yeah, it's easy for us teetotalers to shake our fingers at people, but uh, yeah, I, you know, just doesn't make any sense. Uh, the cerebellum uh, surrounds two areas of, uh, that scientists consider an evolutionary old part of the brain that they sometimes refer to as the reptilian brain. There are two portions of the reptilian brain: the basal ganglia, which means the basic nerve sheath, and the limbic system, which means the border system. 
in Latin. So if you were, if you guys were Romans and we were talking about these things, uh, they would have these names. They would have names like basic nerve sheath and border system, rather than the basal ganglia and the limbic system. So those are the two portions of the uh, of the reptilian brain. The basal ganglia includes the caudate uh, nucleus. Uh, caudate means tail, uh, and it kind of does look like a, uh, a tail. Where is it? Oh, there it is. Yeah, it looks like a tail sticking out. It's that purple stuff. <laughs> the putamen, which um, is, uh, is uh, Greek for stone. The globus pallidus, which is Latin for pale sphere. And the substantia nigra, which means uh, black substance. Substantia nigra, and, and that's Latin. As much fun as all that is, of course. Okay, so you can see where it is. It's right in the middle of the brain. The limbic system is made up of the amygdala, which is shaped like an almond, therefore they call it the almond. The hippocampus, which looks like a seahorse and is, is called the seahorse. It's called the hippocampus. Uh, the fornix, which uh, is, uh, is Latin for arch. And it looks like an arch, I guess. Cingulate gyrus, which means round girdle. Cingulate gyrus is the gray stuff up there. Uh, the olfactory bulb, uh, which uh, is that little orange thing. Where is the olfactory bulb? Well, the olfactory bulb is actually at the end of the, uh, the hippocampus is the olfactory bulb. These little projections out here are the olfactory bulb. And then the mammillary bodies, and you can see the mammillary body at the end of the uh, fornix. <clears throat> These are all the structures that control what's going on. So if you really wanted to focus on a career in this, would it be neuroscience or like yeah, neuroscience? neuroscience? Yeah. Um, we, we found somebody that wants to work here, which isn't easy, you know, in the middle of the Navajo Reservation. <laughs> Uh, and she's a neuroscientist. We thought she was a neuroscientist. Turns out she's something else, but we thought she was a neuroscientist. Which means she would have taught this class and you wouldn't have understood a word that she said. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> I worked in medicine, so you know, all this stuff makes sense to me, but it makes, uh, since I was just a lab tech, you know, I just had little pieces of information. So I'm able to give you those little pieces of information. With them, of course, they're talking about looking at individual neurons and whatnot. So they would be talking about all kinds of things that I wouldn't understand. So it's a little bit easier for me to give you this information than it would be somebody with a lot more information to give you. <laughs> I can talk about diseases because that's how I came in contact with all of these things or surgery or, or things that I've seen in the emergency room. The largest organism in the center of the brain is the thalamus, and that means inner chamber. And the thalamus, you can see, it's fairly large. It's that uh, orange uh, structure. You have two thalami, one on each side of your brain. The thalamus acts as a connector between the upper and the lower parts of the brain. And since it was such a large structure, we thought that it had a huge function. But the reality is it's just a coordinator. It's, uh, it's like a uh, uh, train terminal that sends trains out in different directions. And that's all the thalamus does. It organizes thoughts. It helps you organize your thoughts. It doesn't have the functions that we, we assumed that it did. It doesn't have the control that we assumed that it did. Uh, that happens with the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is a, is a small structure below the thalamus. And hypothalamus just means uh, uh, lesser thalamus. But as it turns out, the hypothalamus controls just about everything in your body. It's the master gland. Even though we say the pituitary gland is the master gland. The hypothalamus is called the hypothalamus or lesser thalamus because it is below the thalamus. In reality, this tiny portion of your brain controls your hunger. It controls your thirst. It regulates your temperature. It controls reproductive behavior. It controls the pituitary gland, which, of course, controls all of your adrenal glands, as confusing as all that is. Uh, so the hypothalamus is really the most important part, portion of your, of, your, of your brain. I have a friend who had a tumor on his hypothalamus, and he had to have it removed. 
He has no hypothalamus. So he takes hands, hands full of medications every day in order to ma make sure that all this stuff uh, occurs because of that brain tumor. And of course you can see where the, the hypothalamus is. They had to go in through the top of his brain. They carved a chunk out of the out of his skull and went down through the middle and then branched out. Yeah, I know. Orthoscopic surgery. Anyway, they took out his hypothalamus. At first they tried to radiate it. They tried to burn it out. And they missed. Oh. <laughs> Did it affect him? I'm sorry? Missing? They, yeah, they missed the hypothalamus and they, they damaged the whole middle of his brain. Yeah, I know. It's really stupid. <laughs> Uh, have, do you guys know what a Seventh Day Adventist is? Have you ever heard of the Seventh Day Adventist Church? It's real popular over in India. Uh, he went to a Seventh Day Adventist Church. They they are ve they're vegans. They don't eat any meat at all. And of course, he's not. <laughs> and he was in the hospital for like ever. And they missed they missed his hypothalamus when they were trying to to cook out the, his uh, his tumor. <laughs> And uh, they hit other parts of his, destroyed the middle of his brain. Uh, anyway, they were some they had been. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Strange religion. Well, it's not strange. Religion. They're all the same. Uh, Seventh day Adventist goes to church on Saturday, not on Sunday. I don't know if that's important or not. Jewish people also go to church on Saturday. Um, they can't do anything on Saturday. I had a friend that was, he was our left-handed pitcher when I was in high school, and he was a Seventh-day Adventist, so if we had a game on Saturday, he couldn't play. <laughs> and he was pretty good. He had a really, really wicked curveball. Uh, two of the most important areas of the midbrain are the tiny bumps known as superior and inferior colliculi. And colliculi just means trough. In the beginning, of course, a trough is, is, a, is a depression. And, and that's what we thought that they were. Just, we didn't realize there was actually a chunk of meat in there. The superior colliculi receives visual information. The inferior colliculi receives information about sound. 14? Yeah, okay. uh, I don't know, I'd show you this. My, I, this is my Fitbit, and this is how I tell time. And it's about to die, okay. But uh, part of it's gone, part of the... So I can only see half the number, so I have to interpret what the number is. I don't have my glasses on, so I can barely see it all. Uh, the inferior colliculi receives information about sound, so the superior colliculi uh, has to do with, with, uh, with sight, and the uh, inferior colliculi uh, has to do with sound. The substantia nigra, the black substance, releases dopamine, and of course dopamine, if you don't have enough dopamine, then it causes Parkinson's disease your in inability to, to, to walk quite right. Uh, you get tremors in your hands, you can't control your hands. So it gives you Parkinson's disease. Now the odd thing is I used to teach with a guy that had hand tremors. And uh, I knew him for five years. And uh, when I first met him, they weren't too bad. And then they got worse and worse and worse and worse. Well, these are Parkinsonian symptoms, if not Parkinson's disease. But nobody else noticed his, uh, his handshake. It was the oddest thing in the world. And eventually it got into his, his uh, vocal cords. So he would talk like this. And nobody noticed it but me. I was the only one that noticed it. I don't know what that was all about. Everybody else so blind to what's going on. Going on in the world, they don't see these things. Anyway, he's got Parkinson's disease. And I told him, and he didn't realize what was going on. He couldn't write. He tries to write, you know, you can't read his handwriting because it's all over the place, but uh, I don't know. It took him forever to write it. Reticular uh, formation runs from the midbrain into the medulla. Uh, this portion of the brain controls sleep and arousal, temperature regulation, and motor control. If you are in a motorcycle accident, fall off the back of your bike, and you, one of the things that will happen is your, your head will hyperextend, and if you hit your skull on the pavement, it will jam up against your spinal column, and it will uh, bruise this area of your body. Hopefully it won't sever it, because if it severs it, then you're paralyzed from the, from the waist down. 
Uh, but uh, it will also put you into a coma because th if, it, if you damage this portion of your body, that swells up. Remember the edema we were talking about before, and now all of a sudden you can't control your temperature, uh, and you're in a coma, and uh, you can't move at all. So sometimes if you damage this portion of your body, you'll go into a, a coma. And of course the edema has to go away before, uh, before you will uh, recover from your, your coma ever wake up. Now potentially you can regain all your function if this area is just bruised. If we just have uh, uh, pressure on the area, it will force this area to uh, arrest your movement, to arrest your temperature control, and to arrest your uh, ability to wake up. So as once the edema goes away, uh, you recover, hopefully. But if there's any, if there's permanent damage to that area, then you'll stay in, your, in the coma forever. <clears throat> and this is, usually will put you into a vegetative state. Uh, how much time do I have? Should I tell you the story of, no, I better not. Yeah. <laughs> When I worked in uh, Omaha, uh, Omaha had a helmet law, and Iowa doesn't. Iowa doesn't have a helmet law. So uh, people would be running around on their motorcycles. They would run into a car or something. They'd run off the road. They'd hit their head on the pavement, and then they'd be in a coma for an extended length of time. Well, sometimes they severed their spinal column. Sometimes they damaged their spinal column. Sometimes they just bruised their spinal column. If, the, if there was too much damage, then it would put them in a vegetative state. If they were in a vegetative state, a lot of times the family would go, well, just go to court. I mean, yeah, you know. We've already determined that there's too much damage. And if, the, if you pulled the plug, of course, they would stop breathing, and then they would die. And of course, you were feeding them anyway with feeding tube. Uh, so one of the things that we did, uh, we used to transplant a lot of uh, organs, and we got a lot of organs from these guys, these lovely fellows that were had, had an accident on their motorcycle. So we would harvest their organs, and our job wasn't to transplant the organs. Our job was to keep keep them alive so we could harvest their organs. That was my that was our job at my hospital, and then we would take the organs and ship them down to another hospital where they were transplanted. Which is kind of cool if you think about it, but uh, unfortunately, of course, it's because of their desire to ride a motorcycle and fall off the back, I guess. Anyway, they, they survived. They survived in someone else's body. Isn't that, isn't that nice? Because they were, they were gone. There was not a whole lot of So, you know, that's one of the things that we did. And it was because of this area. Is that okay? We used to harvest the organs and save people alive. <laughs> well, the horrible thing was we were the ones that harvested the organs. Somebody else did. I mean, it was like we were the we were ghouls, you know, harvesting organs. I mean, you can save some. You can save like nine people's lives with 